You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys, and as I warned you last week, while this is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, today is the 300th episode, and for once, I wanted to try something entirely different from our usual episode. So for one week only, you'll be hearing from nine of my hiking friends, some of whom I've hiked with and some of whom I've only met on the podcast. I mean, all our guests on our regular show speak of things that have changed their lives. So this week, I wanted to focus on one life lesson that my guests have discovered. It didn't quite work out as one lesson sometimes, but I have short chats with them all and try to tease something that they've taken with them from their time on the trail. There's no middle section, no book reading, all of that resumes next week. Think of this as me stopping, sitting on a rock somewhere up a mountain and chatting with my friends as they hike towards me, sit a while and move on. And I've very deliberately chosen this order in which to speak with them. First up is a woman I met back on my 2014 through hike. She and I finished the trail together, along with two others, but I met this lady first. She was hiking with another couple, but we hiked around each other for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, before teaming up as we hit New Hampshire. This is Pat Coat, or T-Bird. Right now we've got probably one of the people who I've stayed friends with over over the years. One of the first people I met on the trail, which is, uh, this is Pat Coat, or T-Bird. Hey T-Bird, how are you? Good. Good morning. Hey, congrats on 300th. I knew you could talk, but uh, that's impressive. <laughs> Excuse me. That's, that's a bit rich if you don't mind, by the way. <laughs> Joe, might have, Joe might have one or two things to say about that as well. <laughs> so we hiked together in 2014, and then we went back on the – we went on the John Muir Trail together, which was terribly disappointing in 2016. By the way, do you remember what I said to you when I said goodbye to you guys at uh, on the John Muir Trail? Oh, yes, trial, you I had did. To get off. What did I say? You, did. you said we would always have Katahdin. <laughs> that was such a great thing to say. And it came off the top of my head. I love that. <laughs> yes, yes. Channeling your, who's the actor from <laughs> Casablanca? Oh, 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 Humphrey Bogart. Of course it yes, is. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> so we've had the benefit of time to ponder this. You know what I'm asking? I'm asking about, you know, life lessons or things you've gleaned from your time on the trail, particularly on the Appalachian Trail. So what have you thought about? Well, Steve, I know you've given a lot of talks on the AT and and uh, I have too. And one thing I like to say at the end of the, the talk as part of trail takeaways is that the trail is a great equalizer, mm-hmm. that no matter your age, your gender, your socioeconomic background, you all have to do the same thing. And, and an expression grown from that that's used quite a bit in the coat household is you can't buy your way up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> that it's it's hard. We're all hiking that same trail. We all face the same ups and downs. No one can do it for you. So the code expression, you know, you just got to suck it up, just do it. You can't buy your way up the hill. <laughs> so and that's did, definitely did, something. So that's did the trail teach you it. that? Or, did, or, or I mean, we we I, I guess intuitively, I, I, when I think, and uh, more I'm talking to people about this. I think the trail did teach me one or two things, but more than that, I think it made me aware of things I should have already known. Well, I, I think that, you know, taking it a little bit different route, maybe than what you asked, but taking it further, you know, talking about those hills and you can't buy your way up the hill, the hills or mountains, I think are a great metaphor for life. And I'll throw a few examples at you. Um, You know, sometimes there's no payoff. I mean, how many bluff and sassafras mountains did we climb? (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember most of them having a view. They're kind of nondescript. But those climbs, I mean, they gave us experience. They prepared our bodies. They prepared our minds for the next and maybe bigger climbs. Like, you know, the White Mountains. We climbed all day, and then we came out across Franconia Ridge, and it was just (sighs) exhilarating. And all that came before that really helped us achieve that day. 
And, and you don't always get a payoff. That's that's a reality too. Um, we had terrible weather. If you remember, we had terrible weather through the presidentials when we went. Yeah, yeah. The first time, but I saw it. The second time, I saw it. So that's that's my thing about saying you may not, you know, you may not see see these great views, but when they're there, you should really enjoy them. Absolutely, and and you do. You, you sometimes they do re- lead to that great payoff. You know, our first real one probably was maybe Blood Mountain down in in Georgia. Yes. Yeah. Where you get to to look down, you got to see Atlanta. You look, a lot of times, you're up there, you're looking back, and you can appreciate where you've been and what you've done. And maybe you look forward, and maybe with a little trepidation, maybe with excitement, maybe both. When we were seeing Katad, and oh my goodness, yes. we were oh my excited gosh. as could be. But there was probably a little trepidation there. You know, the trip's coming to an end, and just how hard is Katahdin going to be, et cetera. Do you remember Pat, by the way? Because I'm, 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 now I'm interrupting you and I apologise. Just things come to mind, so having heights with you. I don't know if you know, but the picture on the Mighty Blue show, of the Mighty Blue artwork, you took at Pema, I think it's called Pema Dumcock Lake, where, where yes. I'm, I'm leaning, I'm, I'm sort of leaning forward on my knee and there's, they could, people don't know it probably, but Katahdin's in the background about first, it was the first time we saw it really well, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. And we, I think we all were kind of in our own little, in our own minds thinking about, hey, here's Katahdin. We're, we're yes. really seeing it. We're sure we're seeing it this time because sometimes we thought we saw it. <laughs> That's right. <yeah. laughs> and, uh, you know, the, we're often looking in the wrong direction as well. Yeah. We? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and then there's other times like, uh, you know, we're looking forward to a climb. I remember Klingman's Dome. Now, we weren't together right. at that time, but that's that's yeah. the tallest part on the trail. Yeah. And I I was excited to get there. I was excited to go through the Smoky Mountains. And it just so happened that I left early from camp that day ahead of Joe and Andy. And I never saw it because it was all socked in. <laughs> you know, there was never, never a view there. I didn't even know there was an observation tower because I, I guess I walked right underneath it and had no clue. <laughs> oh, that's what that's um, but then there's other times where I think the, the payoff is actually the climb. I don't know if you remember... Unica Mountain in Tennessee. I do. I love that. Oh, my that. gosh. It's after my beauty, beauty, just past Beauty Spot. Yes, right after Beauty Spot. And, you know, people yeah. had said, you will know, climb, and it's, I don't know, it was a 1,200 or whatever foot climb, and there's no view. I love, that's actually one of the favorite parts of my hike because it was a just a deep spruce forest. It was Different. eerie, wasn't it? Yeah. It was and eerie. The, when I went through, yeah, it was misty. And that yeah. song, Little Red Riding Hood, <laughs> <laughs> kept going through my mind. You know, you, oh, you shouldn't be walking through these spooky woods alone. Um, but it was, I thought, just spectacular. So you don't always need the view at the top, you know, just the no. climb and the beauty. Do you, th- do you think about the trail often, Pat? Still do it, yes. I mean, it comes up in a lot of things. Uh, it's just, it's you know, it was six months, five months of your life, yeah. But it really does have a huge lasting impact, and in, in a lot of ways, you know, yeah. think about other takeaways from the, from the trail that I point out is kind of just the goodness of people. Uh, not that I thought people were bad, but boy, we saw so much good on that trail. I do think people represent the best of themselves often on the trail that they don't necessarily take over into real life. Some people do, obviously, but generally, I think you you can present yourself as whatever you whatever you are, can't you? Mighty Blue was definitely different to Steve. Yeah, and and that's that's an interesting perspective because you you can take on a different persona out there. You know, you, we all have well, we didn't all, but a lot of people have trail names. Yeah. And they can tell you whatever they want. <laughs> and, That's right. Yeah. And you don't necessarily know what, that it's true or not true. And, and another piece is that, you know, the normal barriers, I think, really do come down on the trail that people will tell you their life story very quickly. And you've only known yes. them a half a yeah. day, <laughs> <laughs> if, if even that at times. Yeah, and, and you bizarre. know, you, you trust and you believe that they're telling you the truth. And, you know, the people that yourself and myself, we've gotten to know each other off the trail. So, you know, you've got validation, but you don't have that for everybody. And, <laughs> uh, right, you know, yeah. but I, I really believe that most people portray themselves, you know, f- fairly accurately on the trail. Yeah, um, I hope so. I hope yes. so. Well, look, yeah. it's lovely to talk to you again. I'm glad you still think of the trail. I, I you know, obviously, obviously, doing the podcast, I think of it every every darn day. But I think I think I probably would do anyway because it has such a massive impact upon my, upon my life. And your point about it being only five or six months, 
out of a longer life, in my case, then, you know, it, it is still a percentage of that life. And yet it, it seems to hold a far, far larger percentage of my life because of the because uh, I hike the trails. And honestly, I haven't met anybody that's hiked the trail that that's not true for. I mean, it, it's, it seems to be a universal takeaway from the trail is that it really is hugely impactful. And I yeah. like to tell people, you know, everybody should hike the trail <laughs> because it is such a wonderful life experience. It's well, all the trials, tribulations, but all the the wonderful accomplishments and the people you meet. It, it's just, I think, life changing in in many ways. It sure is. Well, look, great to catch up with you again, and um, I just wish you and Joe well. Uh, your grandmother again. So God bless you for that. Uh, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks Bye. for thinking of me. Cheers. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah, the trail is a great equaliser. And you notice it pretty early on. All that baggage you sometimes bring to a trail can be left during that six months or so of simplicity and freedom. I also love that expression that Pat used. You can't buy your way up the hill. <laughs> and she followed it up that there's not always a payoff at the top of the hill. Pat was our logistical guru on the trail, and frankly, my next guest and I may have had trouble getting to the end without Pat's tremendous organisational skills. And that guest is my buddy, Lyda Knopp, or Ken Hall. Here's Ken. So now, this, is, this I guess is probably one of my first real major hiking partners. This is Ken Hall or Lyda Knopp, with whom I finished in 2014. Hey Lyda Knopp, how are you? I'm doing great, Steve. Good talking with you. And you. And uh, we've had a bit of a... <laughs> Bit of a technical snafu this morning, but we get that <laughs> we get that on this uh, station every every now and then. So it's just the way it goes. Um, I understand. Yeah. So you and I walked really the last couple of states together, didn't we? New Hampshire and Maine, you know, major major states, and and we'd actually met each other. I think it was three hundred miles before we first met each other in Connecticut, and then we just didn't see each other, did we? For about another three hundred miles. Um, what what did you take away? You know what this is about. What did you take away from your hike in terms of a, a lesson that, that the AT taught you? There are so many aspects of AT that changed my life. And uh, I got to thinking about that and I, I thought, but there is a number one. There's a number one thing that really changed my life. And, All right. and it, it was, it may sound corny, but it was the friends and the people I met on the AT. It was those relationships that developed because of the AT. Um, yeah. You know, the AT is so darn interesting. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic conversation starter. <laughs> I mean, isn't it? I mean, it, it crosses all kind of political lines, uh, age, religion. It's a great way to start a conversation with people. Did you find that when you came back that people didn't really understand what you'd been through? I used to tell everybody in 2019, because from my experience in 2014, you come back home and everybody wants to hear your stories for about three weeks. Then they just want you to shut the hell up because <laughs> they can't really relate to, you, to what you've done, can they? No, uh, the, the vast majority can't. But there are some that, that do, and those individuals they want to pick your brain you can just you can pick them out of a crowd so they start asking you multiple questions and, and it's i just love it and i said oh i got one here i got somebody that's really into it so, oh right yeah well it's funny it's funny actually having done the podcast now now 300 times now this this is something that i get emails all the time people pick my brain as if as if i'm i know what to do you and i staggered to the end of that tri trip didn't we <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not staggered. sure we were great guides <laughs> staggered is the correct word it, it is but i i tell you it's really the people when i say a conversation starter let me give you an example. Uh -huh. a, few, a few months ago, I had a minor surgery, uh -huh. um, but I had to talk to the anesthesiologist in the operating room. So they wheeled me in the operating room. Uh -huh. The anesthesiologist walked in, and he said, good morning, Mr. Hall. And he said, I heard you walk the AT. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the operating table. And I said, uh, yeah. And then he starts asking multiple questions, you know. And then... 
all the nurses in the operating room gather around and, and I'm just, I can just see delaying all the operations down the line all day long. You know? <laughs> but it, that was just an example of how normally you wouldn't have a conversation. It'd be a good morning and that was it. But the AT brought it to a personal point. You know, you understand? It, I do. I, you know, I do. And I, when I go out, um, my, my girlfriend is very proud of the fact that I walk the AT and she mentions it at every available opportunity <laughs> to people. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and, and I'm afraid that people, uh, my close friends, get tired of hearing stories. But, you know, I have endless amount of stories I could talk about. Um, yes. A, about that, that six months and on, be, my, on the AT. But, you know, I think that's, and, uh, and I, and, and I'm, I only just thought about this as you were saying it, actually. I think that when you someone says something and they want they want to talk about something, discuss something, you often say, well, when I was hiking, this happened. So it's almost like the 80 taught you so much do you feel it's almost your point of reference for the answers to virtually everything. That's what it feels like to me anyway. And, and it is. Yeah, and because you had that experience and because you, you want to share that experience with someone, you put that in the context of what you did in your hike. It, it's just you normally would not have a long conversation with a lot of these people. No. But the AT drives that that conversation. And it is so neat. And it's like I say, it's so darn interesting that uh, it's just a great conversation piece. Yes. <laughs> Did you when when you got back? Uh, I know I know you carried on hiking a little bit, didn't you? You you went you and Deb yeah. went to do is it Hadrian's Wall Path. We did, we did, and uh, then uh, the Camino. We did the El Camino. That's beautiful. Isn't it? I love that. Absolutely love yeah, that. Yeah, I love that. And Deb loved that too. And so, what was that? Did that did that have the same impact upon you, or did that just keep that whole thing going about friendships and people you meet on the trail? Well, it did in a way, but not like the AT. The AT is so unique that, and the people are so aware of it that, it, it, you know, I can mention the Camino or something and you get a, a stare. Yes. But, but, <laughs> but you mention the AT and people automatically get it, you know. Yeah. And so it, it's just a, it's a great way to form relationships uh, through conversations with people. It's funny, Ken, you know, when you set out for that trip, you didn't know the impact it would have on you. I bet you never thought that would be it, you know, that this this would relate back to your life. You know, you, you, did we, we went nearly eight years ago, wasn't it? Early 2014 we went. So, yeah, it's yeah. nearly 2022. And to think that yeah. we went that long ago and it's still impacting us. Through, and you you haven't hiked one of those long trials since then, have you? No. 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 Yeah. And, no, and yet no. it still has that impact upon you, which I think is just – Amazing. Yeah, and, and you probably would know better than I, but I I don't know if I hike the AT again that I would have that same impact that it did the first time around. I, it would probably be a, a different form of a relationship or uh, impact that it had on my life. Yeah, you know, what? I, I'm not sure myself. I, I I think I said something the other day that I've I've been. I, I know what I learned in 2014. I think I've come to terms with 2014 hike. I don't think I've come to terms with the 2019 hike. It was very different, very enjoyable, and and all these things and all these things that happen on the trail form part of your hike. I don't think I've had long enough time to really consider what happened to me on that trip. So I, I'm most of my experiences and my thoughts about this have come from my 2014 hike. Interestingly, to me, That's anyway. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I cherish, I tre- and and I hope this is the same. But I've developed lifelong friends because right. of that first time. I know when I came up to see you, I was going through. I think it was going to trail days or something. It's one of my favourite pictures of me. Us with our arms around each other. You with that beard you grew on the trail. You still haven't got rid of, by the way. Yeah, and it's just, just it was such a it's friendships. We don't see each other much, but it was friendships you meet on the uh, people you meet on the trail. Just awesome. Absolutely awesome. Well, it's a perfect bonding experience. Uh, the trail family w- was very important to me, even because I had walked so far up to Connecticut alone, yeah. really. Yeah. But you you experience the struggles together. You're experiencing the beauty together. You're you're taking care of each other, you know, and you see each other during the when days you don't feel good. It, yeah. It's like a it became it comes a family thing. 
It really does. It really does. Okay, man. Well, look, it's been lovely to talk to you again, catch up with you again. You are, uh, you're ever in my heart. I always think about you guys and you and Deb and, and obviously T-Bird as well. It's just been great to catch up again. So we'll speak again soon, okay? Good. Great talking with you, Steve. Okay, buddy. Take it easy. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I was fairly confident that Ken would talk about people and support from others on the trail. I think that the two of us met at the perfect time to team up. We were both a little bit concerned about the whites, so our timing could not have been better. I can tell you, I count myself as supremely lucky to have met and hiked with great people who impacted me then and who I cherish as friends now. Ken and Pat from my 2014 hike were those two people. They even showed up to surprise me on my 2019 hike. Now that is support and friendship. And then, after I summited, I returned home and I started writing. It took me ages to write my books, but they were published in 2016 and it's thanks to many of you that they sold over 10,000 copies and I'm always going to be grateful for that. And it's from those books that this podcast began. A friend of mine suggested that Americans love the English accent. (laughs) I never worked that one in England, by the way. And that I should record an audiobook to go with the print books and the Kindle books. I found a recording studio at a local library. Then I met a bunch of guys who were recording podcasts. Now, I listened to podcasts at the time, but I'd never really given it any thought. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to like my voice on a podcast. (laughs) One of them said, have you heard yourself? (laughs) So I started thinking about it, and the podcast released its pilot episode at the end of September 2016. It was fairly crappy, but I persevered, got a bunch of guests on the show, and, well, I've never seriously looked back. And by the way, those audio books have still not been recorded. An early guest on the show became a firm friend. We met up in person in 2018 at an outdoor retailer show in Denver, where he was at the time. But we really bonded when he came and joined me for three days on my 2019 80 through hike. Here's Clay Bonnyman Evans, or Pony. Well, my buddy from 2019 and, and before, actually, and also recent uh, uh, recent PCT completer, Clay Bonneman Evans is here. Hey, Clay, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, are you feeling fit after your uh, 2,600 miles? Well, not as fit as uh, the day I got off, as you well know. Uh, it, <laughs> it, does, it does try very hard to uh, come back all the weight and the, the lack of fitness. But overall, yeah, I feel pretty cool. good. Well, you know what this is about, because um, you've, you've actually written the book on it, which is The Trail is the Teacher, which mm-hmm. is kind of neat. So you've got some life lessons. Were you always aware that the trail was teaching you lessons when you were out there? But did that become, and I'm, I'm mainly talking about the, the AT right now. Yeah. No, I would say it actually took me a while. I had done one shorter through hike prior to the AT, the Colorado Trail, right. and I, you know, I didn't, I don't think it's long enough. It's about 500 miles to really sort of get the way it crystallizes on the AT. So no, it did take me a while. In fact, as much as I love the CT, really the AT is my first true through hike, as far as I'm concerned, as far as that kind of big experiential piece. Sure. And that experience gave you obviously a lot of thought. I know you wrote a, you wrote a journal along the way, a blog, Mm -hmm. and then turned into the book. So because you've only got about five or six minutes here, uh, can you tell us, there is a life lesson that you picked out you think you'd like to share with people. Yeah. And, and as you know, and you're probably going to hear from everybody you talk to, there are a lot, but I think the one that, that matters most to me and, and, and I did start to realize that it took me quite a while. I know you're familiar with this one too. And that is, you know, the differences between us as humans, we make an awful lot of them in the, as Dixie calls it, the synthetic world. Yes. But boy, the trail has a nice way of putting us all together, no matter who we are, where we've come from, what our differences are, what our beliefs are, obviously not diverse yet in certain ways, but really in most ways, incredibly diverse. And what I learned is that you don't have to be exactly like somebody. You don't have to think exactly like like somebody you don't have to believe like somebody to be really good friends and supportive human beings and i really wish that that you know i wish that that lesson could be learned by everybody uh, and and translated to the real world because i think that's what it is it's 
it's kind of we're all in we're all humans we're all in this together and that i would say is the biggest piece from the at for me and you know i've thought about that one quite a lot you know i i i think it's a uh, it's it's a massively important thing to know and understand that we're, we're all together i hiked i said this to somebody the other day i hiked in 2014 with a 17 year old for two or three days yeah the kid's 17 and we're hiking together as buddies and in, you you attain that buddy ship pretty much straight away don't you what do you think it is about the trail that allows all those barriers to come down you know so i i sort of think of it as like a bit like boot camp i've not been to boot camp but i've spent a lot of time around military people and they talk about sure. it it's a really tough thing that we're doing out there you know every single day you've got certain you're going to suffer in certain ways. You've got to be thinking ahead and so forth. So everybody's really doing the same thing. We're all aware of what the challenges are. We share those challenges and it feels like we're all pulling in the same direction. In addition, I would say life gets boiled down to an essence. You, you have to worry about certain key things. You're going to have to find a camp. You're going to have to eat. You have to find water. You've got to dig cat holes. You got to walk. If you're going to do this thing and succeed, it's quite simple what you have to do, but those things take a lot of energy and a lot yeah. of time, and you can really use the support of other people in various ways, psychologically or otherwise. And I think what it does is it sort of sh strips away all the things that we tend to get upset with each other about. Of course, you can have a conflict on trail, but we're not worrying about the little stuff and the unimportant stuff. We're all pulling the same direction, and we've all got the same challenges that take up most of our energy so i think it, we're all really in the same boat well funnily enough we're all pulling certainly us northbounders we're all pulling towards katahdin and of course the southbounders we're going the other way and funnily enough when i started meeting the southbounders they seem different to us oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> isn't totally. that funny and, and yeah. i've only just thought of that they, they did seem different to us because they had their own goal as well they were pulling towards and we were pulling towards katahdin i mean we all must have gone to got a bed especially within the last three or four hundred miles of the trail thinking I'm going to be at that brown sign soon. That's yeah. what we're every night thinking. We're all going the same way. And we all want the other person around us to do well as well, don't we? Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, I, I call it sort of the uh, instantaneous camaraderie, instant love, instant intimacy that occurs on the trail. And now, you know, over 6,000 miles of, of long distance hiking in, I also realize that, you know, I, I'm very sad to say this. It doesn't really extend into the real world. There are friends that you'll have. There are people you'll stay in touch with. But all of that sort of very supportive, instant, you know, stuff that you have on the trail, it's not necessarily going to translate. By the way, I had the experience of being a Sobo because I flip-flopped on the AC. That's right, so yeah. I hit the brown sign and had another 400-something miles to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was great because I got to walk back through every single person I'd met along the way. It was it was a great pleasure. That is cool. So, and a lot of these these thoughts were formed from the AT. Did did your any of your thoughts evolve on the PTT, or did they? Was it the same sort of thing? Not really. I, I feel like it's really pretty much the same thing. Um, the PCT is quite different. I, I would say for me, one key difference is. There just aren't these natural gathering places called shelters or even as many hostels. They're yeah, just not there. Yeah, the, so, shel the shelters are so important, aren't they? And I don't yeah. think I realized how important they were until oh, yeah. I actually got out there and was, I, I mean, I wasn't looking forward to it anyway, but once you get in them and around them, they're such yeah. a hub, aren't they? Yeah. You know, the AT is sort of like a string of pearls or something like that, where it's like you, you've got the thin trail and then boom, you've got a community, thin trail, boom. And that's happening, what, every you know, eight to 12 miles, usually yeah. something like that. Same with towns and hostels, the community, you know, all that. A PCT is much more of just a string without a lot of pearls because there aren't really shelters. There's a few little structures here and there, but you're sleeping on a patch of dirt often by yourself, unless yeah. you're, you know, specifically hiking with a person. So the community is quite different, but it was still great. I mean, I, I ended up with just as awesome relationships and friendships on the trail i mean it was you know it's always the best part of the trail it's hard yeah. to, it's hard to sort of understand but that's really true for me absolutely right well look 
This is probably a record for us, Clay, because I'm going to keep you down to to eight or nine minutes, which is quite rem- remarkable because we talk about the trail a lot. I know that when we when you came and joined me for those three days, uh, it was one of the best times of, of the trail for me. I really enjoyed spending time with you. And if I look to my right right now, I can see your picture when we were hiking together. It's on my that map, my map on the wall. So I oh, always yeah. see you, see your grinning face there, oh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. and it was fun. But look, it's it lovely to talk fun. to you again. Lovely to talk to you again, mate. And um, stay well. All right. All right. You too. Hey, thanks. Okay, buddy. Take it easy. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. (laughs) The trail does indeed have a nice way of putting us all together. That support you get from your fellow hikers is unlike anything I've ever experienced. As I know many of you will recall me saying, people want your success almost as much as they want their own out there. Clay came out to support me in 2019. He made me go in front and said, this is your hike. I'm going to go at your pace. That was so thoughtful and kind of him, mainly because he's a much stronger hiker than I am. But he was there for me, and I was very touched by that. And as Clay mentioned Dixie, I thought I'd ask her for one of her takeaways as well. Here's Dixie. And today's guest, or this guest here, (laughs) we're going to speak to now is a friend of the show. Been on a few times now. This is Jessica Mills or Dixie. Hey, Dixie, how are you? I'm fine. How are you, Steve? Well, I'm good. I can now turn my text message off, uh, which is <laughs> excellent. That's okay. Here we are. This is almost live. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So you're actually in a house, so you're not hiking right now. I am not hiking right now. When it gets cold, I, I shut in for a little while. I've, All right. <laughs> I've learned that. Unless I'm on a through hike and then somehow I have that, like, I'm going to finish grit and the cold doesn't bother me as much. If that makes good for sense. you. Good for you. But, yeah, it, it's... I mean, I'm in Florida now, and it's getting cold now. So, well, for us, it's getting oh, cold. Oh, right, it's, right. Yeah. You sweat fi- while decorating Christmas trees. It was there. 52 <laughs> degrees this morning in my, on my <laughs> walk. <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't get frostbite on your toes or anything. That no, was okay. Now, you started hiking, um, and I can still remember. I didn't watch it at the time, but I've watched it since. You going through the arch in 2015, and so seven years ago, seven years ago, that was nearly. Um. You've come a heck of a long way, done lots of different things, done lots of different hiking. You've done your YouTube, you've done you've got those amazing knives, which apparently you cut yourself with the other day. Is that right? Well, I shared that <laughs> from a couple of years ago, but yeah, oh, I, right. okay. I've, I've respected it more since then. Quite right, too. So the question this week is just one question. You know, you've been out on these trails, and I'm particularly thinking about the Appalachian Trail, but what have you learned out on a trail that you may not have learned had you stayed in Colorado, for example, where you were before? You know, now you, once you've made the decision to go hiking, your perspective's changed and obviously so much has happened to you in your life. Is there a life lesson you think you could identify that you've learned? 100%. Uh, uh, m- many of them, but uh, one of the ones that I continue to think about, I would say more or less on a daily basis, is don't quit on a bad day. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but when, I don't know, the newness of the trail really wears off around maybe Virginia. I mean, for some people before that, but folks start dropping like flies and you see people that seem so enthusiastic about the trail in the next town. And they're like, Oh, I'm going home. And Mm. for me, it almost seemed like this plague that was taken over like a sickness, you know, (laughs) and you didn't know who was going to be next to fall. And, uh, but I, I just realized that a lot of those people, they would go home and they would regret getting off if, Of course, it wasn't a financial issue or an injury, uh, but I I told myself, I'm just not going to quit on a bad day because I think that that's what happened to them. And if I'm sitting on a a mountain summit one day and and the birds are singing and the butterflies are fluttering around and I'm like, this sucks, well, then it's time to go home. (laughs) But short of that, I wasn't going to allow myself to quit. Anyone can quit when it's raining or cold or miserable. That's, you know, when you want to quit, but... And I, I feel like that transfers over to regular life because many of us quit other things on a bad day, like relationships. You know, you get sure. in a fight and you quit it. And to me, you know, you've got to be looking at that person out on a lovely date and go, okay, I'm I'm done with this. And then it's okay, you know. Yes. It's just <laughs> but but it has to be that situation where it's like, okay, I really don't want to continue this. Cause I I'm certainly not encouraging people to continue something that makes them miserable or that they hate. Um, I feel like that's maybe a lesson in itself. We're always told when we're little, don't be a quitter, right? But I think it's okay to quit, but you have to make sure it's 
just not on a bad day. And do you think that's something you you learn from the trail? Because it's just so perfect for the trail, isn't it? You know, because it is it does suck often for a week at a time. You know, yes. it's, it's horrendous sometimes. You know, I, I've got this. I, I would hate anybody to think, as I'm sure you would when you're doing your your videos as well. I would hate for anybody to think that every day is sunshine and roses and an easy walk because it just isn't, is it? And there are times you just go through this again and again and again. And you think, what am I doing out here? Especially, I find in the middle of the night. <laughs> you wake yes. Up. Yeah, it's like, I'm sorry, I could be in my comfortable bed right now. And I <laughs> chose sleeping on the ground. Uh, yeah, it makes you question your sanity sometimes. It, it's and that's, I try to portray in videos or pictures that I share of the trail. It's not just, you know, perfect Instagram moments out there. There are certainly <laughs> many, many hours of suck in a day. But in the end, somehow, it's still all worth it. And it is that type two fun when you come home, you're like, wow, that was so great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, there are there are highs and lows. But overall, there's a huge perspective shift to be had where I think you appreciate more in life. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, and I know that this is a risky question to ask people because most people are going to say, I believe, I may be wrong here, most people are going to say, oh, it's the people. You know, and it is always the people that make make you hike. But I think to actually learn a life lesson that you may not have learned in r- real life, the trail is just so perfect for that sort of thing, isn't it? So I'm I'm glad we I'm glad we talked about that. Look, um, I'm going to have you on the show again some t- say soon because I know you've done so much hiking since we last spoke as well. I just want to ask you one last question though. And I asked you this question back um, when I interviewed you, I think the second time. Um, I can't quite remember actually when it was, but I said to you, when you're old and grey, which I know you will be one day, when you are old and grey, where you'll look back and which, which which trail will make you smile the most? You said the Appalachian Trail at the time. Is that still the case? Yes. Is it? <laughs> 100%. Yeah. You know what? And that old and grey thing, it makes me sad. I'm like, I don't want to be, but then I think, yes, I do. Because, you know, not everyone has the opportunity oh. to grow old and grey. So. Absolutely. But, right, yeah, yeah. The, the AT... Uh, you know, it's like, again, a first love. It's it's the one that allowed that perspective shift and, and was kind of the the gateway drug to all of the others. Oh, you know? yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's would got you, a special place in my heart. Would you think you'd ever do it again? Or is that just no, not enough time in the day? <laughs> uh, I think I think I probably would. Uh, the, the longer it is since I've done it, the more desire I have to do it again. I I don't have any plans you know, nothing scheduled for doing it. But I mean, there are only so many long trails in the US, right? And oh, yeah. I don't know. Especially now, especially now you've been talking about Grandma Gatewood so much recently. Yes. You, know? you don't want yes. to appear like you don't want to appear like a slacker, do you, compared to her? I know. She did it three times. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely. Do you, think amazing. You'll, you think you'll ever do it again? Do you know I wanted to do it? I put myself up for the oh, Devil's Backbone Brewery. They weren't gonna have a chief hiking officer. What a job that would be. Drink and it beer would, and walk. There you go. And it would have been my third time in my sixties, which would be equal Grandma Gatewood's record. I always thought about that as well yes you have I'm, to I, do that I, well no, i've got i've only got one next year 2022 i'll be 70 but that's in october so if i did it again in 22 but i've got already other plans for next year so I, I don't think i'll be able to do that well i don't know that i think her third time she was in her 70s because oh, was she i think so i think the first time she was 67 and then the next time was two years later and then she did the third one as a section hike like oh, pieced it together. Right. So as long Slacker. as you knock it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I tell you what I, I do feel. I'm sure you feel this way, way yourself. You've been very diligent in making sure you do all the thing, right things and you can complete your hikes. But you damn, you know damn well, one false move could have knocked you out of that hike on the first day, couldn't it? 100%. There was a guy on my PCT hike that stabbed his eyeball with a, oh. uh, just, he, he was setting up his, or picking up his tent and bent down and there was a tree there and it just stuck him right in the oh. eye, just the right way. And so that, that was it, you know? So yeah. yes, absolutely. There are any little things can happen with injuries and, and you're off. And the way I think to myself is I've been lucky enough to have two amazing experiences, you know, of two hikes that were completely completed successfully. So I'm not sure I really want to risk risk losing that. I know <laughs> I know darn well, and you know darn well. If you went again and it was your last hike, and it's likely to be one of my last hikes, then to get injured 
and fail to finish it, that would just tick me off more than I can tell you. No, I agree. I think I'd have to like beg people to carry me or something, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm finishing this. I, I yeah. totally understand what you said, but there's another record, uh, Nimble Well Nomad, you know, you could Give hope break. To, uh, <laughs> to break his record. He's only 13 years old to me. That's the tough thing for me to take it, <laughs> take on yeah. board. But, but look, I really, it's lovely that you, you've come on, on, on the show for the, my 300th. I really appreciate you being Congratulations here. again. Thank you so much. And uh, you've been a, Jam always and very helpful to me, so I appreciate your time always. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Cheers. Not quitting on a bad day is a surprisingly important piece of advice. As we said, being out there and having your third or fourth straight sucky day can be miserable, but you have to suck it up and carry on. And we all get that perspective shift out on the trail. I think that all of us start to appreciate more in life. I know I have. I want to share something about Jessica that I don't think I've mentioned before on this show. Back in 2018, when I was going through a tough period in my own personal life, she was on the Continental Divide Trail and we were recording that hike. We charged people to listen to it at the time, but as many of you know, it's now available for free on the Hiking Radio Network site for everybody to listen to. Jessica and I would record every three or four days, but we'd also talk before and after I hit the record button. She's a chatty woman. As I say, I was going through a tough time in my life, and one day she called me out of the blue. I don't even think we were due to record that day, and she asked me how I was. That's what she's like. She is so accessible and so relatable, and it really touched me that she thought enough of me to reach out and ask how I was. Love her. And moving on to the podcast part of my life, another previous guest on the show, Anna Huthmaker, was my choice to add a new show to my own show and actually start this network. Anna was and is the head trial dame, and it seems appropriate that she too should be sharing her life lesson. Here's Anna. Well, our guest now is Anna, Anna Huthmaker. Hey, Anna, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you, Steve? And you've just been teaching violin, so that's impressive. We're, we're, uh, we're speaking in the evening, and uh, how'd your violin lesson go? It was actually a string bass lesson, and it was awesome. It was actually a really good one, so it, it left me happy and excited. Super duper. Well, you were my you were my first Anna. You were the first person I asked to do a, a do a podcast with. So I'd love to know. I know hiking has been very impactful in your life and backpacking and all and all that. And you've been. We, I listen to your journals. Obviously, I edit them, so I listen to them all. And they're I find them really fascinating. How up you are about your hike all the time. So tell us what is a life lesson that you've got from hiking. From hiking, I've probably gotten a million life lessons, but the biggest one I think for me has been that there is no such thing as one goal or one mountain or one hike. It's a bunch of amazing experiences strung together that one just leads to the other, to the other, to the other. Um, But can can I actually tell you like the biggest change that's happened for me? Sure. The biggest change for me has actually come through your podcast and you giving me the opportunity to do a podcast because from that, I really... I didn't set her up, by the way, just so no listeners. Oh. I didn't set her up with this until we got in cold with this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's so true because I was thinking about my podcast, which I have to tell you, I'm extremely grateful for. But it's so interesting because I always knew that everybody has a story everybody has a story and it doesn't matter you don't have to be famous you don't have to hike 400,000 miles everybody has a story but what has really come to me through hiking and then doing the podcast about hiking is the relatability of our stories to each other you know we always talk about the trail being the great equalizer and how we um a bunch of us can sit around a campfire at the end of a day's hike And it doesn't matter what you do for a living, where you come from, how much money you make. You have this thing in common that's got become even deeper and more profound in all my conversations with other hikers in the podcast. But you, you've known that you you hiked the AT. Was it two thousand three or two thousand five? Two thousand three. It's quite so quite a while ago, and there weren't that many women, I guess, on the trail. But there's uh, you and Bumpkin Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) on 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 the on the trail, and. It must have been quite daunting at the time because the percentage of women going then was much less than it is now. 
Have you found changes over the years with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so cool. And so for me, I didn't think so much back then about being the only woman on the trail. If you've ever listened to my podcast or anything I've ever done, you will know that I was focused on... Also, I'm every one of them. (laughs) I know, I know. But I'm just, you know, I, for me, it was always, the focus was I was the only overweight woman on the trail. And like a lot of times I would be the only overweight person. Every now and then you would see a man, but it was more rare. So for me, it wasn't the female thing so much, but I will say it's been amazing to watch throughout the years. The numbers have climbed to such a point that um, to me now, there are men and women there, you know, the diversity of all kinds has just exploded, at least in the United States on trails. Um, And lots and lots and lots more curvy women on the trail that before may not have felt like they belonged. So that makes me so happy. How out of sorts did you feel, if that's the word? How how out of your out of your comfort zone did you feel when you were first one on there? Because you know you were you were a curvy woman. Oh, yeah, the curvy woman. Yes. Um. Um. Probably, woman, of, well, woman of a curvy nature. Was it woman of a curvy nature? Yes. That, yes. That's the kind way of saying you know I weighed two hundred sixty two pounds when I started the trail. Oh, kind guy. And I'm five feet tall, so that is I was like a watermelon in some you know Gore Tex going up the trail. And um, for me, I think that I had made a little bit of, not peace with it, but I had been planning it for several years. So by golly, I was going to do it. Now, I carried, you know, you think my weight was heavy. The weight of my fears and insecurities was heavier, but I just left my body and I just threw those in the back of my head and tried to ignore them as much as I could. And if you listen to my journal... You know, I do. I did think about it from time to time, but mostly there's so much living to do on that hike. You know, I was meeting amazing people and seeing incredible things sure. and doing amazing things. So it was fine. So did you gain, com- I mean, you must have gained confidence anyway, because you could do it. So you were do- doing it real well. Um, and has that confidence lasted over the years because of what you did back then? Oh, yeah, totally. In fact, it was bigger than just a hiking confidence. Of course, I gained confidence on the trail in terms of feeling so incredibly comfortable there. And I gained confidence in helping other people hike and teaching them. But I gained a confidence in life. I mean, I came home and I looked at my parents and I went, I'm going to Africa. And then I came back and went, (laughs) I'm going to the Arctic Circle. And all of a sudden, like, I believed that, there was no reason I couldn't go anywhere and do anything and try things. It it cracked my world completely wide open, which is why I didn't start trail names until several years after my through hike attempt, because I was busy. <laughs> so the life lesson for you was it opened up adventure to you, I guess, yeah. is, is really yeah. in summation. And I have to say, if you want to, if you want to just distill it down to three words, I um, I actually talk about this when I took a trip to Ecuador once, but always default to yes. Oh, wait, that's four words. Default four to words. <laughs> yes. Always default to yes. Do you want to yeah. try this new thing? Yes. Do you want to go to this fair you've never been to? Yes. Do you want to climb this mountain? Yes, 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 yes. Always default to yes. You'll never, I have never been sorry. Yeah, because you may fall on your ass or fall on your face. It doesn't really matter, does it? Because no. all you do is get up again. And you have, to, I mean, the thing from, I, I, I'm i going to take my time at the end of this episode to tell the life lessons I've learned. And my prerogative as the host, I can tell as many as I like. I exactly. learned, learned so much, so many lessons. But, you know, I appreciate you coming on and sharing yours. And I'm so glad that you um, you agreed to be a host on on and this podcast journey with me and it's been fun and I've always enjoyed ch- talking to you. So thanks for very much for coming back on. Well, thank you. And thank you for giving a voice to all the people on your show that you do. You're the best. Bye. How lovely that Anna should have found a lesson, not only in a hiking, but also in a podcasting. There's no such thing as one goal or one hike. It's all about the overall experience, whatever that experience is. And when she moved into the podcast, she learned a bunch of new stories that people could relate to. I think that, as podcasters, we do gain a further insight into stories, particularly as they relate to hiking. It's definitely been a bonus for me as well. And of course, once we had Anna on the show and a functioning network, I decided that a section hiking podcast would appeal to maybe a different audience, or even the same audience, 
And Julie Gayhart, or Jester, had been a guest on the show in, I think it was 2017. We'd stayed in email contact since then, and when I said I'd be out on the trail in 2019, she asked if she could hike a day with me. We met at Woods Hole Hostel, one of my favourite places on the trail, and along with one of my hiking partners that day, Cushy Life, we hiked from Woods Hole into Perisburg. As I say, I'd been thinking about a section hiking show, and Julie seemed perfect to be the presenter of that show. So we started Jester Section Hiker, and I wanted Julie to come on and share her life lesson. Here's Julie, or as she prefers, Jester. Well, our next guest is really a friend who I've made more of a friend uh, since she's been a fellow podcaster. This is uh, Julie Gayhart or Jester. How are you, Julie? Hey, Steve or Mighty Blue. I am doing well. And before we get started, I have to tell you a sincere congratulations on 300 episodes. <laughs> Bravo. It's been bloody exhausting, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Well, what what people are probably not taking into consideration and what I just realized, that's 300 episodes on your show. But you've got 100 plus episodes on Anna's. 100 plus now on mine. <laughs> so you are well over, man, you're into 600 episodes. Uh, so bravo. It, I, I'm about 600 episodes. You're right. It's kind of kind of amazing. But anyway, you know what we're here for. This is the 300th uh, episode birthday. But really, the purpose of this, because we've all learned a lot, um, both hiking and in our case, podcasting as well. So if you could think of a life lesson that maybe that has come to you that you wouldn't otherwise have learned had you not been backpacking, what would you think that might be? And I, Steve, this is a really tough question. I hope other people that you've recorded have said <laughs> that as well. It's really tough, and I've really had to pause and think about it. And it's been a couple things, a very deep appreciation. And more importantly, I, I have to say that the trail – has ultimately given me what I call a purpose-driven life. I mean, I don't talk about this a lot, Steve, but back in 2006, um, as you would say, when I was flirting with the trail, and I've tried to flirt with other trails, but the <laughs> Appalachian Trail is... It's uh, the one in your heart, isn't it, really? <laughs> it, it's the one in my heart. Um, I was not an educator. Hmm. And when I got the taste of the trail bug... Um, I really centered my life around being able to hike the trail. Hmm. And that's when I got into education. That's when all vacations turned into, you know, hiking the Appalachian Trail. So really, I don't know. I guess it goes back to that old saying that you say all the time that I say that everybody hears. The trail provides. That's the lesson I've learned. And not only does it provide for me in some way when I go hiking, it has provided for me in my life. It's given me purpose. It's given me a name, Jester. Um, yes. I have, how, do, yeah. how, how do you wear that? I mean, it's funny, actually. You know, I, I'm wearing a mighty blue shirt right now. and People can't necessarily see it. But it's funny that we are different people when we go on the trail. And it's it's almost like it's deliberate. We, I'm not sure we necessarily change so much. But we do present the version of us we want to, don't we, when we go on a trail. Are you happy to be Jester? And is Jester I different? Am. And is Jester different to Julie? Yes. Okay. So I am very happy to be Jester. And I find more and more that individuals in my personal life uh call me Jester. And Julie is more, it seems more of my formal and professional life. <sighs> but I am way more Jester. I'm probably 90% Jester and 10% Julie at this point in my life. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that strange? You know, we've often talked about trail names on the show and people definitely grow into their trail names on the trail. So it's given you a purpose, for, purpose within, within your life. What was it about hiking, do you think, that gave you that purpose? I think it's way more than the hiking. I mean, there's more to the trail than the physical act of hiking. I think we all go to the trail for some reason or another. Maybe it's for the miles. Maybe it's, you know, you've had this dream all your life to hike the Appalachian Trail or other trails. But for me, it is, I don't know, it sounds so cliche, but it's like a a cleansing for for me. I know. (laughs) Hiking on the AT specifically, um, and like you said, say this, I flirt with other trails, but specifically on the AT, I don't know what it is. 
I, I don't know. I interviewed Hawk a couple weeks ago, and he said it's like going home. It's like, you know, you go through the states and you visit different neighborhoods. And I, when he said that, I was like, oh, my God, no one has described it better than that. And that's the way I feel. Yeah, it's funny, actually. I, I've, I've told people on, you know, in the past, when, when I went again in 2019, having been first time in 2014, I was scared of my own shadow in those days because I didn't know what I was doing, of course. Second time around, as soon as I left that car park, having walked down from spring, I walked through the car park or the parking lot, whatever you call it over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, felt trailhead, trailhead. <laughs> I felt totally at home. I knew exactly where I was. And it was a shock. Isn't that amazing? It was, it was almost a shock to me. And it was it felt like I, I was at home as well. So the corollary of that, if that is the word, the corollary, it, does that mean then you're happier on the trail than you are off the trail? I think I'm happier, yes, um, but more ways than just physically hiking. Um, I, I like a really simple life. Uh, I mean, I could literally wear the same outfit all the time. I mean, I'm that simple. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I like to, to, yeah. I mean, mean to talk to you about that, yeah. I know. Here I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, mean, I wear the same blue sweatshirt all the time. Every time we record, I, I mean, the same, but it's almost like – it's such a gift. And even with this podcast, it's like we're able to share, you know, each week the guests are able to share and we'll, we're able to talk to them and give the gift of going out on the trail and having other people figure out what their gift will be from the trail. Yes. I mean, there is no yes. greater conversation than that. And that was another thing. This podcast has given me, you know, a different sense of purpose. Um, you know, now I've started a hiker safety account over on Instagram, but it's yeah. like, it's it's just so driven by the community and what we do and what we achieve and what we have achieved on on the trail. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I think the sense of purpose is a really interesting thing to take away from it, and and I wonder whether you wouldn't have achieved that sense of purpose had you not been on the trail. So maybe the trail is your, if the trail is your sense of purpose, it always makes you wonder what, I've often thought, what would my life be like if I hadn't done this thing at all? And, you know, I'm sure you you do as well, don't you? I do. I feel like I would be a mess. <laughs> I do. <laughs> a hot mess. <laughs> I would be a hot mess. I feel like I would be a mess because, I, I don't know, I think people that go on the trail, you have to be driven to want to hike. 2,191 miles or whatever it is now or whatever it was the year uh, people hiked the trail yeah. or whatever trail, there has to be a drive inside of you to want to do that. And I think a lot of times people step on Springer Mountain or Katahdin or nowadays Harper's Ferry for a flip-flop sure. and there's something that got them there, but what do you do with it once you finish? And the finish has provided me almost as much as spending time out on the trail. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, you know, funny enough, you say, as soon as you're saying that, I could see you at the conclusion you were going to come to there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think things change so much for me once I finish this as well. So, hmm, okay. Sense I mean, of think of the things you've done. You've started a podcast. You've written books. You've gone back to the AT again after you said you were never hiking again. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I live. I actually said in, in presentations, I said, I will never. Ever, ever hike again, <laughs> and it I was. did. So who, who, who knew it? Yeah, it's it's the sense of purpose that it gives you. Okay, nice one. Well, well, thanks for sharing that with us, Julie. Because I think um, I'm getting different answers. I was expecting it to be people, 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 but it isn't. It's always the people, anyway. But it's really the other things that you've learned that I, I think so interesting about what it's like to hike the trail. So we'll catch up again soon. And thanks for coming on. Thanks, Mighty Blue. And again, congratulations. Thank you. How often have we heard the trail provides? I guess many of you who haven't done this hike will roll your eyes a bit when you hear that. But it does provide. So many people have not only said that, but added stories that kind of prove it. You need something when you're out there, and it will just happen. And of course, I love that the podcast has added to Julie's purpose-driven life. She's always looking to innovate on her show, probably more than Anna and I do. Funnily enough, when Julie mentioned the number of shows I put together, of course, I decided to end them up for this show. In all, as of today's date, this will be my 639th show. Not too bad, eh?
Of course, I can't forget our newest podcaster, Courtney Miller, who responded to my Start a Podcast and Join Hiking Radio Network campaign. Courtney started hers recently, and she's three episodes in. So, as a novice podcaster and a fairly new hiker, I wonder if Courtney had learned anything from her time on trail. And so, our next guest is our newest podcaster. This is Courtney Miller. Hey, Courtney, how are you? Hey, Steve. I'm great, thanks. Yeah, well, you've been rushing about a bit. <laughs> I have. <laughs> so, so you've only just just got online, which is pretty cool. And this is in the afternoon of the Wednesday before the show goes out. So we're, the presses are on hold, spe- especially for you. <laughs> Stop so, the presses. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There you go. We're ready to go. Um, so you know what this is about. Uh, and I know you're a relative, you know, you haven't done a huge amount of hiking, but you, you feel that you've always, you've also already learned some lessons about what it's like to be on a trail. So tell us what your life lessons are. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, there are a couple of really big life lessons that have, that pop first to mind. Um, One of them is the way that I relate to my physical body, because especially as a woman, uh, there are a lot of pressures to be, to look a certain way, act a certain way within your body. Right. And I have, I wouldn't know. (laughs) Well, you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, So, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs as far as weight problems and and being underweight and and obese. Like, really, I have run the gamut. And when I go out there and I hike, I I connect to my body in a way that is very, uh, like, it takes all the pressure off. All of a sudden, I notice that my body really does do everything I ask it to do. And maybe the fact that my pants are a certain size really doesn't matter all that much. So that that's that's one of the things that that has was a really it was an unexpected gift. So, so how how'd you learn that then? So you you're out on trail and you felt your your body was working better than you expected it to, or what? Yeah, absolutely. Like I wasn't. I mean, the, the first, my uh, the hike that I went on this past summer, we were hiking for five days, and the first day after the first day, I was a little bit sore, you know, that night. But the next day, I really wasn't. And, um, and, and we did, you know, some strenuous hiking with a, I had a fairly sure. heavy pack on and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was, it was probably about 30 pounds and my body did everything I asked it to. And there were a few times when, when my body also asked me, Hey, could you just stop for a second? <laughs> 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 so just really kind of getting in tune with that in a way that I, that I'm not sure that I ever really was before. Um, and that's a, it's a really unique gift that the trail gave me. Wow, I, I, I've not heard that before. Actually, so you, you so you, you did it give you a confidence then? Because yes. if, if you if you've been unha- not unhappy with your body, but if you if you've been no, going I've been up, unhappy going with my way- body. Let's we'll oh, call right, okay. a spade a spade. <laughs> okay, I was being ca- I was being careful there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> if you were if you were less than happy with your body, so so right. so that that got rid of that, and did that translate back to when you came back to life? Came back to yes. life when you came back to real life. Yeah, that's what it feels like, right? You come back to life. Um, yeah, actually, it translated quite a bit. It, yeah, I and now I'm ready for another. I need a booster shot. <laughs> I okay. need a trail booster shot going right, back out right. there and and reminding myself that I that I can do those things. And you know, sort of related to that was being on the trail alone with my husband for 5 days and I don't know the last time we had 5 days alone together. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, that that kind of brings in the other life lesson that I learned on the trail was that kind of um that relationship with him and how we can lean on each other in a way that where he has strengths, I don't and vice versa. So we, we really do a good job of, of, um, complementing each other's strengths and weaknesses and being out there on the trail. I already knew this about us because we've already been in some other adrenaline pumping situations where we've had to deal with things together. But, um, being out there on the trail just put us into even more in sync in a way that was just wonderful. And being out there on the trail and feeling more confident in my body definitely also gave us a little extra gift of feeling like we were on a honeymoon again. <laughs> Ooh, I won't elaborate, that's... but you can guess yeah. where that goes. I, I, so... <laughs> I know where that's going, yeah, yeah. Is this why you're called Hiking Unfiltered? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so does, does he feel the same way? Did he get a similar impact in, uh, in terms of that rela- the relationship thing? I, I won't ask him about his body, but yeah. you know, did, did he get the similar sort of thing as well? Yeah, 100%. He just – he was – he was really pleased because he was, he, it's funny because we didn't, 
We talked about this when we were once we were out there. But before right. we went on this trip, I did a lot of training. I was kind of pushing myself on my morning walks to walk faster and faster to get better cardiovascular health. And sure. I was pushing myself to do some strength training. I did a bunch of squats. I was I was trying to make sure for me in my own head, I wanted to not be the reason for us to not be held, you know, like I didn't want to be the speed bump. So I wanted to make sure that I could hold up my, my end of things. And unbeknownst to me, he actually was having this same insecurity in his head before we started. And oh. once we got out there and he realized like his body was responding very quickly and kind of whipping into shape very quickly too. He was like, I was, he said, I, he confided, I was really worried that I was going to, you know, I was going to hold this up. And did it. and so we both kind of had, without talking to each other about it, we had the same insecurity about being, you know, the slow one. Well, that's that's both of you being in sync because, again, isn't it really, yeah. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's funny how, it's funny how the, the trail can do that. You, you can get in sync with a partner who is, is the same sex as you. I, Tr Trigger and I were in sync when we were hiking in 2019 and we knew – what the other, almost what the other one was thinking from time to time. So I find that really interesting how you do get something from the other person because there's no other distractions around, aren't there? Yeah, that's that's true. And and there's actually neuroscience that can prove why that happens. But there there you literally do get on the same brain waves when you're with somebody a lot. So if you did have a trail partner who was just a friend or even somebody, you know, how we pick up our tramway along the way, even yeah. if it was somebody like that and you spend two weeks solid with somebody, you're going to get on the same page. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's an interesting little thing to share. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show. Good luck with the podcast. It's gone well so far. So let's, uh, let's hope it keeps going well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> well, I hadn't thought about that before. She discovered a body could do things on trail that she hadn't expected that it could do. And the rest of it, well, Apparently, that's what being unfiltered is all about. You can hear all of our seven different shows on the Hiking Radio Network. I hope you catch up with Courtney's latest, which dropped this past Monday. So we've covered my podcasting. What about my second through hike in 2019? Of course, for that, I turned to Trigger and Cushy. Here's Trig. Well, now we've got my partner from 2019 with whom I hiked, I think, about 1,700 miles. This is Trigger. How are you, Trig? Good morning. Good morning. You good? Feeling well? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm doing very well, very well. Two robust old men, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we're, both, we're both 70 next, 70 next year, so it's, uh, it's kind of a time for right. reflection. And, you know, you and I spent a lot of time together on the trail in 2019, and you're a great hiking partner. And, and I just wonder... Um, what you've taken away from that trip, and maybe you've learned things about it since you come home. But is there something, some life lesson you learned from the trail that it has really stuck with you since you come home? Yes, when I first started, you know, I, I, you you did all your research, sure. you looked at all your equipment that you might need, and I've watched Dixie on the trail, sure. and, you know. Or her her AT adventure, yeah. and you look at all this equipment, and you try to narrow it down, and you buy more equipment that you really need. And what I failed failed to do was to mentally get prepared. The mental side of it, I think, is a whole lot more than the equipment. Oh yeah, definitely. So challenges come your way, no matter how hard they are; they're temporary. And you overcome them. You adapt to your challenges as you come. It's just not about equipment. It's more what's in your mind. Yeah, I think you. I think it, what, what the trail does teach us to be is problem solvers, isn't it? It allows you know something happens, and you're, you think, right, what are we going to do with this? Because we have no alternative but to face it, do we? Yeah, and then when I first started the second day, I was uh, I was ready to go and come home. <laughs> And Cushy and Spinner yeah. <laughs> talked to me, you know, don't quit on your, you know, on a bad day. You know, you got to work through things. So what had happened, Trick? What and, happened to get you down? Oh, well, just when you're sitting at home and you all of a sudden your reality hits you and you're on the trail, you're you're taken way out of your comfort zone. All right. <laughs> by a lot. And then it was just a rainy, cold a miserable day at the end of February and uh, 
you know, I wasn't mentally prepared for that. If you don't you know, mind me asking, if you don't mind me asking, why on earth did you think it wouldn't be cold, rainy, and miserable at the end of February in, Georgia, <laughs> in the mountains in Georgia? I mean, you prepared. You had, well, you'd you read about it, hadn't you, before? You knew you knew various things. It wasn't going to be beautiful weather all the time. I know, I know. But I was thinking, well, we're down south in Georgia, and, and the weather's <laughs> not going to be as bad as it is. <laughs> it ain't Florida. It ain't Florida, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. And it was it was a big shock and I was I wasn't prepared for that mentally. So how did you steal yourself for it then? How did you start thinking to yourself, oh wow, I I've got to get a grip here. I mean, what what did you do? It was just encouragement from others. You know, the people that are around you really help you push through if if you're I guess at a a weaker mindset than they are, you know, and and they their experience, uh, Cushy and Spinner, they they've done this, you know, many times hiking, and they've experienced all the bad weather, and and they've come through it, and they encouraged me to continue on, and it was, you know, it helped me a whole lot, you know, first starting out to get over the hard stuff. Did you ever think of quitting again? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, missing missing home, yes. you know, missing Karen. At home. I, I must say, Trigger, you you <laughs> you were funny because we, we had our we had it planned out. We were eventually we were gonna we were gonna um, summit. I think on the Monday, and you said, "Do you think we can get there on the Friday?" Because we couldn't go up the weekend, could we? So you kept pushing me and pushing me. Going, let's go a bit further on. Let's yeah. keep let's keep going on. So you got that mental yeah, toughness yeah. as time went on, didn't you? Yes, yes. It's it's um, you know you just got to keep on. After a while, there's there's, you know, you can't quit. There's no, you've come so far, you're not going to stop now. No. You you sacrifice so much, There's you just don't want to give up. And you're going to push through it no matter what. And when you got there at the end, were you grateful you'd survived? Or were you, uh, were you sad it was oh, over yeah. or just looking forward to get home? Both. I mean, it was such a big relief, you know, summiting and... Yeah. You know, you, you're thinking no more sleeping or eating out of a bag <laughs> of, of, of hot water. Uh, but we both love those biscuits and gravy. We both love those biscuits and oh. gravy, didn't we? <laughs> I, still ha- I still have some of those. I so do I. And you know what? They don't I expire. They don't expire till we're 98, 98 <laughs> really? years old. We talked about that, didn't we? They don't expire till, in my case, 2050. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, it's well, look, I'm, I, you know, I, well, you and I shared something which was just an amazing period of time in our lives. And, you know, obviously I want to thank you for helping me through some of that as well. Um, I'm glad that you did stick around after two days or I would have I would have struggled, I think, to get towards, you know, get to the end myself. So I really appreciate you uh-huh. sharing that with us and, um, and being my buddy when we were on the trail. Oh, well, thank you. It was, I couldn't have done it without you either. You were a big help to me. Team game, man. Team game. And uh, and you know what? There was uh, never underestimate the youth, especially if their name is Terminator. <laughs> you, if you if you have a five or six year old who's just bouncy bouncy all the time and just running down the trail beside you, <laughs> it's, it's amazing what the youth uh, can accomplish. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he was something. He was something. We met some amazing youngsters out there, didn't we? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It, it was a great it actually, time. It actually made me feel, I don't know about you, it actually made me feel pretty good about the next generation, didn't it, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what they can accomplish if they put their mind to it, and they had the encouragement of their uh, siblings and their parents. Yeah. And yeah. you wonder if he ever had a bad day. Because <laughs> it's... The the times that we saw them, you know, they they are just so energetic and and yeah, yeah. oh, just push push push. And yeah, wow. that wasn't that wasn't us. Well, it was you towards the end, actually. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, buddy. Well, look, good to talk to you again, yeah. and um, I'm looking forward to program 500 or 400, and perhaps we'll talk again then about it. But in the meantime, yeah. uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you. And you. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Cheers. Trigg is a very different guy from me. <laughs> We're diametrically opposed politically and spiritually, yet we never had a crossword on the trail, and we were great hiking partners. 
His reflection about the mental approach is entirely on point, and I'd forgotten that he nearly quit in the first week. By the time he and I started hiking together, and I think it was somewhere near the Grayson Highlands, he'd acquired that mental approach and he never lost it. Along with summiting with Ken and Pat in 2014, my summit with Trigg was just as meaningful in 2019. You can't share moments like that and not be impacted by them. He's a great guy and he'll always be true to me. <laughs> in fact, so much so. <laughs> when I was putting this together, I absolutely forgot that his real name was Bob. <laughs> it took me about 20 minutes to remember it. And by the way, I also learned a new word from Trigg that I use quite often now. Dang. And finally today, though certainly not least, we have Cushy. Those of you who know Sarah will know that she's a force of nature and she was definitely the queen of our hike in life up until a harbour's ferry. We split there and only reconnected later. But seeing Cushy again, we immediately fell back into our comfortable friendship and I knew she'd have some insightful things to say about this subject. What she said wasn't what I was expecting. Here's Cushy. So, I've got my friend from 2019. It's Cushy. Hey, Cushy, how are you? Mighty Blue, it's so good to see you. So good to hear your voice. It is so strange, isn't it? You know, we, we saw each other on the trail and we've obviously interviewed since and People who have been special in your life for that period of time. It's they they ask they stay special. You can't you can't help it, can you? I completely agree. I, I think back on our time on the trail with you and Trigger and so many people and just with such warmth. Yeah, it's great. Such a special you guys will always be so special in my life. And talking about life, <laughs> which is what we're here, for, here about, you, you you and I had a number of conversations on the trail, um, mm. and we all learn lessons, and this is what this is about. It's the 300th episode, and I wanted it to be slightly different than normal. So if, if there's one thing that you think that you learn from the trail that you maybe applied to life or you hadn't learned before, what would you say that might be? Well, let me start by saying congratulations on 300 episodes. Thank I you. remember listening to you on trail podcasting and being just awestruck that you could carry on a hike and podcasting <laughs> at the same time. And it's it's tremendous because I started with a video blog and I couldn't keep it up. It was too much to do both. So wow. kudos to you. Thank you're, you. You're remarkable. And I think you've opened this world of long distance hiking up to a lot of people. Cool. Appreciate um, that. As far as long, my life lessons, I think in thinking about this this past week, it's probably a little different than you may expect. And I think it has something to do with the fact that we hiked right before COVID hit. Oh, yeah. And it, the hike itself slowed me down. It slowed life down. You know, the same route that it took me two days to drive down to the trailhead to start at Springer Mountain took me five and a half months to hike back <laughs> past my home and into Maine. And I think that that really warmed me up for what these last two years with COVID in our life has been, is slowing everything down. And it was kind of a precursor, I think, to the way life has been since wow. I returned home. Basically, every aspect of my life has slowed down tremendously. If I look at um, food on my counter that came from the grocery store, I wonder how it was made. And I research it and I figure out how to do it, whether you and I were just talking about the bread making that I was doing. Yes. But, you know, from yeah. um, having chickens now and bees and, um, you know, we live in an area that's rich with maple syrup and I make our own yogurt now and pretty much everything you can think of, we're trying to figure out how to do ourselves just because it's a challenge. It's authentic. It feels rewarding. And I think a lot of that comes from my time on the trail, just realizing the more I slowed things down, the more I understood myself, people around me, how things worked the more rewarding it was. And it's that way when we sat down this morning to have our, you know, granola that was homemade and our yogurt that was homemade <laughs> and lunch, we had eggs that were homemade and, or I didn't make them, but our chickens did, you know, it's very rewarding. It's something that you, you don't just take for granted anymore, but it's also, um, having great peace with being at home so much on our own. Uh, we have very much taken the risks of COVID seriously. Um, sure. And 
I think this has, it's given me the confidence. It doesn't mean I'm less of a person because I'm not out doing things with people all the time anymore or always having to rely on um, my girlfriends or my friends in life or boards that I've served on for my sense of, um, I don't know, sense of place, sense of validation. Um, I've just started to rely more on myself and my own instincts. But do you think the trail then, that that prepared you for this? So have you found that the sort of isolation a lot of us feel, I, I certainly do, mm. you know, I'm at home nearly all the time, mm. you know, and I don't see people, unfortunately. Do you think that prepares you for this better than you might otherwise have thought? And, and, and has, have you found the solitude almost welcome then? Yes. Yeah. And I was just sitting... Uh, we have a, a beautiful outdoor space in our backyard and I was sitting with some girlfriends recently who were all saying, you know, if COVID rears back up again, I refuse to stay home. I refuse to, you know, and I was just thinking, I'm so different. I, I am the one sitting here thinking, okay, I, you know, I can, I can do this. I can handle this. And I think it was just learning to rely more on myself and not that external validation and the external, um, I don't know, energy that life brings you from outside of your home. It's interesting, though, because you were such a, in your local community, mm. very public sort of person, weren't you? So have you, you have you found that that, can you remain public doing Zooms and things like that? Did you reabsorb yourself into the, into the local community? So I have. Um, and it's been a mixture of things. When COVID first hit, I actually... Uh, worked to organize a, a local group that was recognized statewide for our impact on our local citizens during COVID. And so oh, I was nice. very much out in the elements and out working with people on a regular basis. I have, you know, I'm on the town budget committee. I definitely am involved in our local community. However, I've been able to set good boundaries. Um, and that's something I wasn't always able to do before either. And again, I think it comes down to self-validation, you know, looking for that, you know, other people to say, good job, you know, you're important. Instead of saying, I know that I'm valuable, but it doesn't, I don't have to prove it all the time to people. And I can feel happy about serving on the one thing that I really want to do at a time. Do you think that was a... I, I, I don't know how this is going to come out, but do you think that was a cushy thing or was that a female thing, feeling the need for validation? Oh, I don't know. I'd probably have to ask my therapist that. <laughs> 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 but but I, I know that there's, you know, an, an undercurrent there, you know, but I, I think you and I were talking, I, I was just saying how I respected that you were able to podcast during the trip and I was not able to pull it off. But part of me also had a psychological shift halfway through the trail that again, I think I I felt like when I was video casting, I was doing my YouTube sure. channel, um, I was waiting to see what people's responses were every day instead of looking to myself to see how am I going to experience this day? Instead of thinking, how um, am I going to present what just happened today on the trail or where I've been to somebody else, allowing the time for myself to absorb it and not have to necessarily figure out how to talk about it or how to communicate it? Well, that was a male-female thing for me then because I could not so much I couldn't care less what people thought. Mm. It's more a case of I was just reporting what had happened and I wanted people to know that, but I never worried about them. I, I got some negative comments. Who cares? You know, frank, you know, frankly, you know, I, I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because what I put out, there was a story. I mean, do you remember, for example, you and I, we were at a shelter one morning, that young guy played guitar. Oh, I sure do. It was amazing. Absolutely. It was just an amazing moment. And we shared that with people. Yeah. And I thought that was a fabulous thing Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. So, I, yeah, I never worry about it. And also, to be fair, video logging or vlogging is much tougher than podcasting. Mm. You've got to do editing and stuff like that. Um, different, a different sort of editing as well. So you were giving yourself a tough thing to be doing a video every day. I know some people do, and good for them. Sure. But I think that's a real, real tough thing to do. Yeah, it was a psychological shift for me when I stopped doing it. And it took some pressure off, but it also – made me more aware of myself on the trail instead of how do other people see me on yeah. the trail. So how interesting. So maybe well, look, maybe I've taken more from this than I realized. Well, you know what? I, I, I think you're going to find as time goes on, you take more from this. I'm still working out. 
I think I've got come to terms with what happened in 2014 when I went mm. first time. Second time, I'm still discovering things about that journey. Mm. And so I think you're going to find with time, you discover more things as well. Oh, gosh, I hope I don't get any terrible texts from you <laughs> about something you realized that I did to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kushi, you were an absolute joy to hike with. You were, you were so great. And it was, um, it's was it been lovely to catch up with you again because, you know, this is, a, this is a very reflective program for me, you know, this particular episode. So uh, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to me about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And I, it's just such a pleasure to be in your presence. Good to speak to you. Take Speak care. to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. I thought it was so interesting. The hike set her up to slow down and simplify life when COVID hit. Funnily enough, I think I've coped with COVID pretty well myself and I've been quite comfortable at home. Sarah recognised her hike as something of a catalyst to slow everything down. Perfect for 2020 and 2021. Let's hope it's not for 2022 as well. And the shift in mindset, along with the need for validation, were other insightful comments that she made. Vlogging and podcasting on a trail are rewarding endeavours, but be aware, they can take a lot out of you, and for some people, they can impact upon your hike. Now, I guess as it's my show, I get to share a few things I've learned out in the woods and on top of mountains with you. First up, one of the really important lessons to learn is that a life well lived should contain moments. What do I mean by that? Much of what goes on in life and out on trail can be mundane stuff. But when you experience a moment, you need to be present and take full advantage of that moment. I can clearly recall sitting with a light knot as I'm speaking this actually. The sun had virtually disappeared somewhere in the 100 mile wilderness. We'd slack packed, <laughs> as is possible, for the first four days, going back to Monson and Shores every night. But now we were on our own with our packs and putting in those last very reflective miles to Katahdin. T-Bird was settled in for the night, and while Ken and I just sat there in a very companionable silence, just listening to the nut hatches, we were making a bit of a racket before settling down for the night. We didn't need to say anything to each other, we just both felt great to be back in the forest. Then of course, it's the serendipity of the trail that you should try to be aware of. Those moments when something so unlikely and out of place happens that you wonder about it later. My favourite example of this is, once more, the 2014 hike. I was running out of water on the way to Klingman's Dome, and I was convinced, <laughs> for some reason, that we'd be able to refill there. So I necked the rest of my water and pushed on to emerge at the dome, with about 100 people trudging up the pathway to the top of the dome, looking at us as if we were a bunch of hobos, <laughs> quite reasonably, I suppose. But there was no water, and I still had about four miles to go to Mount Collins Shelter. I think it's called that anyway. Then, as I was really struggling to wet my mouth, I remembered a curious incident earlier in the day. We'd bumped into a bunch of guys out on a day hike at the top of a mountain somewhere, and one of these guys had, quiet out of the blue, walked directly up to me and asked if I'd like a couple of candies. I was a bit kind of nonplussed, but accepted them and stuffed them in my hip belt, kind of forgetting about them. Well, wouldn't you know it, I needed them coming down from Clingman's and they sustained me all the way to Mount Collins Shelter. It frightened me, I can tell you, but it was a lesson learned that taking water when you can is a vital part of a successful hike, and it teaches the importance of water in our lives. And, of course, taking the views when they're there. It was so noticeable to me when I went again in 2019 that I was seeing sights that I hadn't seen in 2014, and, of course, I wasn't seeing sights I had seen in 2014. So if you're rushing along, feeling that you need to be somewhere, you may miss a beautiful sunrise or a sunset, or even in everyday life, you may witness an act of kindness that you may not have seen as you were rushing to be somewhere else. Just slow down, look around, and you'll find that this world, in the woods, in the forests, and in the cities and towns, examples of beauty and kindness everywhere. I've got loads of life lesson examples. Perhaps I might even write a book about them someday but I'm going to finish with one more. On the trail and in life, it's important to lighten your load. The lighter your pack or your baggage in real life, the easier, more simple life can be. Only take what you need as you'll be carrying your life on your back for months on end. That encourages you to declutter your life when you get back home. 
dispensing with unnecessary stuff, vendettas, bitterness, will help you live a happier, more simple life. Try it and find out. Finally today, and I only realised this as I was talking to my friends here on the show, it really is all about the people whose lives we intersect. These people, the ones who agreed to come and share their experiences, they're the ones who have helped enrich my life. Don't ever forget that. It's going to serve you well. I'll see you next week.